Thank you, everybody. You can be seated. Uh, it's been great. These these four days always fly by, you know, because uh, there's there's these, and then we, you know, Pastor Chris is, uh, and Sue are they're, they're just some of the best leaders in the world, and um and so they, they you know, I I never understand why a church goes to all the trouble to bring me in and then doesn't they don't utilize me except for certain things. Um, I can tell you that does not happen here. <laughs> And, uh, and, and I'm very glad about that. It makes your stay in Toowoomba nice when you feel like, I mean, it's one thing to preach because it's time to. It's another thing to feel like when you left, you moved the needle one or two degrees. And, um, and, and that's, that's a very good thing. And, and I would say um, that, you, you know, Dallas Willard says this, when the familiar becomes too familiar, it becomes unfamiliar. And, um, and, and I would urge you to never uh, allow the... Um, the respect and the honor and the and the understanding of just what you have here in Toowoomba. You have two of the greatest pastors in the whole world right here, and I, and I think I think that that is. <laughs> if you're the type that likes to follow along in an actual Bible, Ephesians chapter two. We we'll get that in a second. Um, and and as always, our stuff, our, our our resources are out there: CDs, DVDs, USBs, direct downloads. I've said that enough. You know where it goes. All I'm asking you to do tonight is. Um, if, you, if you know you're not going to get anything, that's fine. If you're going to grab something on your way out, please do so quickly, like in the first 10 minutes or so, 15 minutes. I've, we we got to tear all that down. Um, I, I've got to take it to Clifton tomorrow and, uh, yeah, all the way there. And, uh, and, and my team's got to go back to Brisbane. So if, if you could do that for me, that, that'll be great. So let, let's take a second and let's remind ourselves where, we, where, where we've come. Because I, 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 I strategically put these things in a certain order so that, uh, so that we, we, we could journey t- together. Um, and, 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 I, and, I, and I intentionally mix things up. Like sometimes I trace history. So, sometimes I talk about grumbling. So, so sometimes I try something new. Sometimes I do something topical. Sometimes I look at 17 scriptures and tie them all together. Sometimes I look at one and do that. And so I never want to get caught into one thing. And so I want to, let, let's review where, where we've come. That great faith is not exhibited by having enough faith to get out of something, but rather great faith is exhibited by having clean hands, pure heart, sweet taste, for this will turn out for your deliverance. And we, we talked in the second service about be a part of the song. New, the, what's going on at New Hope is a song. Be a part of the song and never a gong. Do all things without grumbling, but rather shine like stars. Do not just be an announcer of resurrection. May resurrection not just be a doctrine that we affirm, but rather a demonstration of a life that we live. May we offer second chances, receive second chances. May we wake up every day knowing that the infinite possibilities are in front of us and we never know what God is up to tomorrow. Resurrection screams of the old way. He's not here. And our response to resurrection should never, ever be simply staring at the sky. Why would you ever stand there staring at the sky when this must somehow lead to that? May we live our life for other people, for mission, for belonging, for identity. May we live our life proclaiming what the gospel writers called the good news. Now tonight, I want to talk about one element of discipleship because to, to be the thing I love I mean I I don't know if you've picked this up but I'm really really irritated by any thought that Christianity is saying a magic prayer once and then just waiting to go to heaven when you die I don't know if you've ever picked it up but I hate that right and and, and the thing the thing I love about this place and I guess because they're recording this and they're going to put it on the internet, I need to say it this way. As good as anybody else in the world, you guys disciple people well. Like I said, as good as anybody else in the world, you disciple people well. And what discipleship is is simply this. Discipleship is intentionally organizing your life to authentically live like Jesus lived. It wasn't some ritual. It wasn't about going to heaven. Being a disciple was about living like Jesus lived here in order to bring heaven here. And, 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 and as, as all good truths, 
Good truths are often expressed in metaphor, in images. And, and, and obviously the central moment of Christianity, it's already been mentioned a couple times tonight, is the cross of Jesus Christ. And the, I could preach 40 messages on the cross of Jesus Christ, all different, all with different meaning, and I would be right every single time because the cross is just that multifaceted. And I think that's the point. I don't, I don't think the cross has any one meaning. I think the cross is that which defies meaning. I think the cross is that thing that gives meaning to every other thing after it. it. It's sort of hard to dumb the cross down into what does the cross mean. I, I think any time the divine allows himself to die for all of humanity at the hands of a local government, that defies meaning. It's, it's so there's one, it's, it's so everything we read in the scripture are the New Testament uh, writers' attempts to put meaning around that which defies meaning, which is why there's so many, well, it's this. Yes, it is. Oh, and it's that. Oh, yes, it is that. And, and it's that. And, and a couple big things you see is that the cross of Jesus Christ is a screaming out loud that you don't owe God anymore. There is nothing between you and God. The word for that would be forgiveness. All our debt has been canceled. It's these kind of images. And to that side of the cross, we say yes and amen, and we embrace that. Another side of the cross um, is the scriptures say that he didn't just die to forgive you. He died so that you would be set free from slave drivers here, now, today. It's not just about being forgiven so we can go somewhere else. It's about living free here, now, today. And we say yes and amen and we embrace that. But in one sermon, you can't talk about all those things. I want to talk about another side of the cross that I'm not sure get enough, gets enough playtime, but it, I think it's critical to our intentional pursuit to live like Jesus. And, and that is this. This is Ephesians chapter 2. Paul is uh, talking about the implications of the cross of Jesus. And here's what he says. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law and commands expressed in the ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two. So by making peace, so by making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing hostility. One of the messages of the cross that the gospel writers and the letter writers insist is that the cross of Jesus Christ ended any hostility between us and God, and thereby the natural response should be it should end hostility between us and any other human being, thereby making peace. The context of this is the hostility between the Jews and the Gentiles. And he's like, wait a minute, no, 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 no. In Jesus, there is one new humanity. If there's only one God, and that God's holding all people together, then they, we are one new humanity. Jews, Greeks, slaves, free, male, female, none of those things are a discussion anymore. It is the end of hostility. In other words, for us to live like the cross calls us to live requires us to intentionally pursue peacemaking and avoid hostility, which leads me to this. In our discipleship, in our intentional pursuit to live like Jesus lived, how are we doing at peacemaking? Do we tend to escalate hostility or do we find any way possible to reconcile? to make sure that we're living at peace. Listen, the world, in our case, Toowoomba. Toowoomba needs to see us at peace with one another more than it needs to know who's right about any individual thing. The, the greatest witness to the love of Christ that this world could see is a group of people that despite diversity, despite differences, we live at peace and we end hostility. The only natural response to the cross of Jesus Christ that ended any hostility this way is to respond this way with peacemaking and an end to hostility. Listen to how Jesus says it in the Beatitudes when he's teaching people how to live this way. The Beatitudes was written to people who were already following him. He's teaching these people a way to live here on earth. And here's what he says. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. So Jesus evidently ties somehow your basic disposition towards conflict is connected to being referred to as a son of God. Now, 
I am in no way going to try to unpack the theological implications of that. But just simply to say that peacemaking and our basic disposition towards conflict is an important part of living like Jesus taught us to live. 40 verses later, he brings it up again. Watch what he says. You've heard it said that you should love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. So twice in 40 verses, that's a saga, twice in 40 verses, Jesus connects our basic disposition towards conflict to being called sons of God. I do not want to unpack that theologically. I want to talk about that practically, about what that means tomorrow at work. Uh, the, and, and all I'm going to say about this is this, in, in terms of that is, that, is that it is very important to Jesus that in learning to live like he taught us to live, that our basic disposition towards conflict, our basic disposition towards how we handle our brothers and sisters, that we acknowledge that because there's no hostility between us and God, that we're going to live as best as we can, making peace instead of war. We're going to live the best we can, de-escalating things instead of escalating things. Which, so the opposite of peacemaking would be hostility. Which leads to this question, how does hostility work? And, and there's this great story in, in the book of Judges that is very, very, very long. And so for the sake of time, I'm going to tell most of it. I'm going to read about four verses of it, okay? Trust me, I'll tell it well, okay? I just, I don't want to read 35 verses, right? The, uh, and, and the story's about a guy named Samson. And here's the basics of the story. Samson, against cultural norms, chooses to take a Philistine wife. On his way to Philistia, or whatever that would have been called, he runs into a lion, which is quite something, and he, and he kills the lion, which is even a bigger something. He kills the lion and doesn't tell anybody about it, goes back home to his parents. On the way back, the lion's carcass is there and something weird happens. A bunch of bees have taken nest inside the lion's carcass and they're starting to make honey and Samson actually breaks Levitical law by reaching into something dead and eating something out of it, right? So he does this, and it says he didn't tell his parents about it. Then what he does is they get to the place where his wife is, and he chooses to make up a riddle about it. He says, I tell you what, I bet I could tell you a riddle that you don't know the answer to. Of course they didn't know the answer to it. He just made it up. And nobody else saw what he was referencing. So he says, out of the eater, something to eat. Out of the strong, something sweet. And he makes a bet with them for 30 pieces of clothes that they can't guess the answer. Of course they can't guess the answer. He made it up off the top of his head. So six days into trying to guess the answer, they don't have it. And so they corner his fiance and say, you need to get him to tell you, and then you tell us. And of course, she goes, oh, 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 oh. and she says, you need to tell us the answer. So, she, so he confides in her, and then she goes and tells them. Of course, on the seventh day, they properly guessed the riddle, right? So, which was unbelievable because he just made it up, right? And so now he owes them 30 pieces of clothes. Watch how this escalates very quickly. This is Judges chapter 15, verse 2. I was so sure that you thoroughly hated her. Now, what happened is, is he this is strong language. He tells the Philistines, if you wouldn't have plowed with my heifer, <laughs> if you wouldn't have plowed with my heifer, yes, he's calling his wife a cow. If you wouldn't have plowed with my heifer, you'd have never guessed the answer. And of course, now he owes them 30 pieces of clothes. And, and so what he does is they say, you owe us 30 pieces of clothes. So instead of just going and buying, just instead of going, you know, down to the TJ Maxx and buying 30 pieces of clothes, he goes and kills 30 Philistines, strips them naked, and brings the 30 pieces of clothes back. He goes, I owe you 30 pieces of clothes. I just killed 30 of your brothers. Here's your clothes, right? And then he goes back to try to, you know, to, to, to pick up his wife, but they were sure that he had hated her. Watch what happened. I was, so, I was so sure that you thoroughly hated her that I gave her to your friend. Isn't her younger sister more attractive? <laughs> so, 
So the father of his wife gives her to his best friend. And, uh, it, but then he says, oh, I didn't know you were still interested. You called her a heifer. Um, younger sister, maybe? This is just an odd story. Take her instead. And Samson said to them, well, this is the key. This time I have a right to get even with the Philistines. I will really harm them now. And Samson said to them, this time I shall be innocent in regard to the Philistines when I do them harm. So what he does, he's already killed 30 of the brothers and brought them 30 pieces of clothes. He gets like 300 foxes, ties their tails together, puts torches on them, and burns their crops for the entire year. That's called an economic disaster. He burns their crops for the year with foxes. Now watch what the Philistines do. This is like four verses later. Then the Philistines said, who has done this to us? And they said, Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite, because he has taken his wife and given her to his companion. And the Philistines came up and burned her and her father with fire. And Samson said to them, if this is what you do, I swear I will be avenged on you. And then after that, I will quit, right? So what, what's, what's happening here? What started out as a riddle that no one understood because he made it up, turns in, escalates itself, and 30 people die. A divorce happens. A weird sort of situation goes on. Then it escalates further to an entire portion of crops are burned for the year. Then that escalates to a man's entire family gets burned alive. And then Samson ends up going, and, and, and he says, this time, I'm going to get even one more time. So this is just tit for tat, you know? Like, I'm going to do this, you're going to do that. I'm going to do this, you're going to do that. I'm going to do this, you're going to do that. Samson ends up hiding in a cave at a place called Etah, and a thousand Philistines come to take vengeance on him for burning the crops down. He then comes out tied up in loose ropes, and he takes the jawbone of a donkey, and he kills a thousand of them. The whole story keeps escalating until Samson's eyes are put out. He pulls down a temple in in, um, in, in of the Philistines, and everybody dies. Now, follow me here. This whole story started out as a riddle no one understood. It escalates into 30 people dying, which escalates then into crops being burned, which escalates into families being burned to death, which escalated into a 1,000 more people dying, which escalated into another event, which escalated into another event, which escalated into a whole lot of people losing their lives. Now, there's a certain pattern to hostility. Let's walk through this. Next, next slide. So the pattern of hostility is first there's offense. Somebody does something that is against our moral code. You know, according to the Australian Bureau of Criminal Statistics, this is an old stat, but it's from 2004. I can't believe it wouldn't be that much different. 90% of all murders in Australia are morality-based. In other words, very few murders are just some crazy person walking into some place and stabbing somebody. It's almost always, well, they hurt me. They did this to me, so I one-up them. And then it one-ups itself and one-ups itself, and they offended my moral code. I'm offended, and it one up itself into a murder. So there's offense. Then there's dehumanize the adversary. This time I have a right to get even with you. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be innocent no matter what I do to you because of what you just did to me. This is the attitude that Samson is taking. Unwillingness to take responsibility for our part. What I find unbelievable in the story is Samson's, I don't even know, that, that, that internal sort of delusion that, that I owe them revenge when actually he started the whole thing. He started the whole thing by telling a riddle that no one understood. And then instead of saying, okay, you got me. You plowed with my heifer. You got me. Instead of just doing that and then going to the store and buying 30 clothes, he kills 30 people. This whole thing started, but both sides kept saying, because of what you've done, now I have a right to get even. Then there's escalation. We've all been there, right? This is, this is why in some marriages... A disagreement that can start over something as innocuous as how to cut a tomato can escalate itself into insults about the other person's mother. Uh-huh, uh-huh, that's why, uh, yeah, yeah, we've been there. Hey, hey, have you ever had an argument with your spouse 
and it escalated, and before you know it, it's not even about, and, and then somebody finally stops it and goes, hold on, how did we get from there to here? That's escalation, escalation. Escalation is part of the hostility cycle. Then the next, you have holding the other person responsible for the escalation. Since you've acted like this, I have the right to act like this. And then, of course, there's a failure to learn, which leads to repeating the pattern over and over and over and over again. That's the pattern of hostility. The pattern of hostility is we don't learn, we hold the other person responsible, and since they've done this, now I have a right to do this. Since they've done this, now I have a right to do this. What the New Testament writers insisted was that the cross of Jesus Christ was not just the forgiveness of sins, it was not just the freedom from slavery, but it should be naturally responded to by an intentional ending of the hostility cycle. Jesus called it being a peacemaker. Paul called it being a peacemaker, and they, and they tie it to somehow being known as the sons of God. Let me just say that as simply as I can. The biggest way to Wumba, like the, the, the average person in Toowoomba is never going to be convinced about God because you're clever enough with your doctrines. The average person in Toowoomba is going to be moved to follow the God you serve because they look at your life and go, listen, right, wrong, or indifferent, those people are kind. Right, wrong, or indifferent, those people are generous. Right, wrong, or indifferent, those people treat people as they are worth and never as they deserve. Jesus said it this way, if you want to know what God's like, look at birds and flowers. They do nothing to deserve it, but God feeds them and clothes them because they're worth it to him. Being a loving person and being a peacemaker comes down to an internal conviction, a heart attitude, an internal conviction, and a courageous action that says, I am called to affirm your worth, not necessarily because of what you deserve. That is loving. So let's put some language around this. Number one, the cross wasn't solely about forgiveness and freedom, but also the end of hostility. The cross was a physical manifestation of a new way to live. The most loving person acts first to end the hostility. Paul framed it this way, that God showed us he loved us and that while we were still sinners or we were still hostile to God, Jesus took the first step and died for us. Somebody has to act first. And look, if your marriage is in the hostile cycle, uh, one, one writer named Emerson Eggers calls it the crazy cycle. That, that if your marriage is on the crazy cycle, you, you, you got to ask, do you want to be right or do you want to have peace? Because somebody, somebody's got to take the first step to move the marriage off the crazy cycle. And who, who, the question is, is who moves first? Is it the man's responsibility to move first? Is it the woman's responsibility to move first? Who moves first when a relationship is on that hostility cycle? And here's the answer to that. The one who's most mature. The one who's most mature can step out and go, you know what? I'll act first. I'm gonna end this. We're gonna end this right now. This is what Jesus did. While we were still hostile to God, Jesus took the first move to end hostility by dying for us. And there is a natural response to that for how we treat other people. In other words, number three, peacemaking is not passive. It is charging in with a different way to live and changing lives. It's, it's, it's exhibiting something else, an alternative way. Now, I started looking at Jesus' life. Jesus honored a teaching about peacemaking. He called us to that. Paul called it the end of hostility. Other places, it says it all kinds of different places. Be kind one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as Christ, for God's sake, forgave us. It's, it's phrased this way a lot. But sometimes the most powerful way to express something is in images or in moments or in, in things. It, it's one thing to say, blessed are the peacemakers. It's a whole other thing to see it lived out. And so Jesus gives three examples in Matthew chapter 5 around what it means to love your enemies and be known as a peacemaker or a son of God. And he gives these three examples. And some of these, some of these are like, these are some of these ones in Jesus' teaching that make us scratch our head and go, really? What are you talking about? The, the, the first one is to turn the other cheek. Turn the other cheek. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. 
Now, what in the world is Jesus? How, all right, how serious are we about discipleship here? How serious are we about living like Jesus taught us to live? If someone slaps you on your right cheek, are you meant to just stick your chin out and go, all right, go ahead. What is Jesus talking about here? Now, to understand this, you have to understand first century Roman class systems. If you want a great book on this, a guy named Richard Rohr wrote a book called The Sermon on the Mount where he gives an excellent, excellent, full-bodied exegesis of what it meant to live in the first century Roman Empire in their class systems. But here's the basic idea. In the Roman Empire, there was nine levels of class system. She had level one to level nine. And if we were equal, so if I was a level four and you were a level four, we're equal. But if I'm a level one and you're a level seven, you're seen as far below me. Now, if we have conflict and it comes to, to, to fisticuffs, if, if we are equals, I'm allowed to slap you with my right hand because we're equals. But if you're below me, I would never use my right hand to slap you because that would be declaring we are equals. If you're below me, I would hold you with my right hand and I would slap you with my left. The reason is, is that was the hand they used to wipe their bums. It was essentially, I'm slapping you with my poo-poo hand, okay? So if we were equals, I would go right-handed. If, if you were below me, I would slap you with my left. So Jesus is very specific here. He says, if someone slaps you on your right cheek. Now to slap someone on their right cheek, I would have to use my left hand. And he says, so in other words, if someone's declaring that you're below them socially, turn the other cheek. In other words, you don't have to be aggressive back and just sitting there and taking it isn't, isn't the answer. To Jesus, the right answer was to only present the side of yourself that forces them to address you as equals. And they would rather die than do that. This is genius stuff. This is how you handle injustice. Here's what you do. If you fight back against a Roman soldier, you're going to die. You're going to die. If, if you're just passive, you could die as well. Here's what you do. When they strike you on your right cheek, turn the other cheek. In other words, in a nonviolent way, make them address you as equals because you are a human being. Turn the other cheek. Then he uses another, right there, he just uses another example. Here's what he says. And the ne next one is tunics and cloaks. He says, and, this is the next verse, if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. What's he talking about here? We gotta understand Levitical and Deuteronomy law. So, so, uh, so next slide. In, Deut in Deuteronomy, um, if someone sues you and you can't pay, then you give them your tunic as a promise. So if, they w if you win the lawsuit and you can't pay, you just would simply give them your outer garment as a, uh, what would you call it, like earnest money. Like here's, here's some earnest money. I promise I could pay when I can. I don't have any money right now, but you can have my outer garment. And, and so so that, that was all. In so Jesus says, if they come back and you can't pay, just go ahead and give them your cloak as well, it, which is essentially get naked. Right? So he says, he says if, if they take your tunic as a pledge and you still can't pay, just give them your cloak as well. Here's why that's important. Next slide. In Hebrew culture, being naked is not shameful. Seeing nakedness is. Being naked, not shameful. Seeing nakedness is shameful. So the man being sued is putting all the onus on the guy that is suing him. You gotta understand, they lived in a world in Galilee where historians estimate they were paying 87% taxes. Herod, Herod and Pilate and these guys were taking 50% of their fish, 30% of their grain. They were charging them a Roman road tax to move their goods and services. They were charged 12.5% as, as a tax straight to Caesar for the, the divine privilege of having the Son of God rule them. Plus, they had to pay the corrupt tax collectors who were taking their own cut. These people were struggling to survive. Jesus says, when the 3% rich people come and they've already taken your land and they've already taken your house and they're taking more money than they could ever use to, to, um, to help the rich, here's what you do. 
you. If they're going to take your tunic, just give them your cloak as, as well. The question is, what kind of person would do that? that, that generosity exposes greed. The best way to expose greed is not to shout injustice. The best way to, to expose greed is to go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah, here, just have, here, just have, here, go, go. Go. And, that, and, then, and then what that does is that goes away. Oh, no, 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 no. And that is a way to make peace. The, the third example he uses, he uses these three in a row. So turn the other cheek, tunics and cloak. And then he says, um, he says, go the extra mile. If anyone forces you to go one mile, then go with him two miles. If anyone forces you, then think about it. If anyone forces you to go one mile, what's he talking about? Okay, to understand this, we got to understand first century Roman military law and how the Jews were living. The Romans carried 70-pound packs around as the soldiers. And here was the military law. The Jews were class 8 people. On a scale of 1 to 9, class 8. Roman military law said if you had to walk from here to there, let's say that walk was 5 miles, you could force... The, the, the lower classes to carry your pack for you. And that made sense to the military. Why would I carry my own 70-pound pack when I've got five underlings here and I'm going to make them carry my pack? But they put rules around it because, you know, when you're crucifying and raping and maiming the whole world, being humane about pack carrying is important. So Roman military law said... You could, for, because remember, they got to remember these people pay taxes and you don't want to make them do that all day and then they can't work and pay taxes. It's counterproductive. So here's what they said. As a Roman military soldier, you could force a Jew to carry your pack one mile. So if it was a five mile walk, a Roman soldiers would come in here and they would go one, two, three, four, five. You guys are coming with me and you would carry mile one. You would carry mile two. You would carry mile three. You would carry mile four. You would carry mile five. And that was perfectly within the law. But if you made someone carry it more than a mile, it was a court martialable offense because you're keeping them from working and paying taxes. So Jesus says, if they come in and force you to carry it a mile, at one mile, take off running and go two. They'll be running you down trying to get you to stop because they're going to be docked their pay for doing that to you. This is genius, nonviolent resistance, peacemaking stuff. Real life. This is, this is where they were. Here's my question. Where does this fall into how we live in Tutuwumba? How does this, how does this affect how we're going to treat somebody tomorrow? Who's coming to your mind right now that you've been in conflict with? And the temptation is, do I escalate the conflict? Or do I live like Jesus and somehow be a peacemaker? There, there's, there's, there's one more image I want to share with you. It's, it's, uh, I, I called it healing the ear. To heal the ear. There's, um, this one is it's a very moving story. And Jesus is in Gethsemane. And it's in the middle of the night. If you ever watch a movie about Easter and it's happening in the middle of the day and there's a lot of people there, bullimus crapimus. <laughs> this was after Passover. Passover started at sundown. It was four hours long and they had four glasses of wine, which is why, and then so Jesus has a four-hour Passover with four glasses of wine, walks to the Garden of Gethsemane. Do you see now why he's asking his disciples, can you not stay awake for an hour? Like, what's the matter with you, right? They've walked in from great distances, had the biggest meal of the year, and drank four glasses of wine. Staying awake, hard. And these Roman soldiers come in with a small group of people. I've been to the place in Israel where Jesus' trial was. It would fit on this platform. No question at all. Uh, it's easily, actually. So these Roman soldiers show up, and they're led by the servant of the high priest, a guy named Malchus. Now think about this, right? If you're the servant of the high priest, what are you in training to be? The high priest. You're learning all the customs and the rituals and what you say and what you do and how you act. You're learning the thing to do, which brings Levitical law into play. The high priest had certain rules about him, and they get very, very specific. You could read the whole thing in Leviticus 21. Here's just a part of it. Next slide. For no one, this is talking about who could be the high priest and who can't. For no one who has a blemish shall draw near. A man, a man blind or lame or one who has a mutilated face, good Lord, or a limb too long, <laughs> 
or a man who has an injured foot or an injured hand, or a hunchback, or a dwarf, or a man with a defect in his sight, or an itching disease, or scabs, or crushed testicles. Good God. <laughs> Which leads to all kinds of questions like, was that actually a problem? <laughs> Next slide. No man of the offspring of Aaron the priest who has a blemish shall come near to offer the Lord's food. Since he has a blemish, he shall not come near to offer the bread of God. So here's what would happen, right? In Jewish culture, to be a rabbi, you had to earn it. You had to go to school, man. You had to prove yourself. To be called, in the whole New Testament, there's three people called rabbi. Jesus, Paul, and Gamaliel. That's it. You never see Rabbi John, Rabbi James, Rabbi Peter. No, Rabbi Jesus, Rabbi, these people, you had to be serious. But to be a priest, you were just born into it. You just were born into being a priest. Like it wasn't, and so because you were born into it, it ran the potential for bad eggs. Like, like what would happen if a righteous priest had a son who was wicked, but he was born into it. So now you run the risk of a wicked man being your representative to God. You can't have that. So here's what they did. You could read about this in some ancient history books like Josephus and other places. It says, what they said is, is that when someone was deemed to be a bad egg and the people did not want him to be the representative before God, what they would do is they would give him a physical blemish because the physical blemish would disqualify him from being the one that represented them to God. And the most common one was they would hold him down, they would pierce his ear and pull, right? Which would hurt, you'll get over it. It's not, you know, but it would leave you with this permanent sort of, um, I don't know, forked earlobe or something, right? And that would disqualify the, the, the priest from being somebody who serves. So here's what's happening. The Roman soldiers are coming in, led by the next in line to be the high priest. Peter gets irritated at this and pulls out a knife or a sword. The way we know it's Peter, Matthew, Mark, and Luke say a certain companion of Jesus. John's like, Peter! John like grabbed Peter by the neck and he's, just threw him right under the bus and then backed over him, right? If it wasn't for John, we wouldn't know. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, let's protect him, a certain companion of Jesus. John, Peter, everybody know, Peter. Peter takes out a sword and chops the man's ear off, which was way overkill to the, like, if you've ever read this, did you ever wonder, why didn't they arrest Peter? Wasn't it against the law to chop a man's ear off in front of the soldiers? Like, was it legal to chop a man's ear off in Jerusalem, these crazy Jews? What's going on here? Here's what's going on. Because he was the next high priest in line, Peter is simply saying, you can't tell that you're fixing to kill the real temple. Then you have no business serving in the temple made with the hands of men. And I'm gonna make sure you kill him. I'm gonna make sure you never serve again. And he chops his ear off which would have permanently disqualified him from ever serving again. What was Jesus' response? Peter, put your sword away. If you live like that, you'll die like that. That's not what we're about. We're peacemakers. Uh-uh. Hey, hey, don't do that. Don't be, don't be an ear chopper. Uh-uh. No, no. We don't do that. And Jesus reaches down and he heals the man's ear. What did he do? Well, he restored the man's ear, but, but beyond that, what was he doing? He was restoring him back to the office to serve in the temple of his father. In other words, the guy that was leading the charge to kill Jesus, Jesus didn't just heal his body, he restored him back to his office. That is living like Jesus. Which leads me to this observation. This coming Sunday, 30, 40, 50 people might be coming into this church from Toowoomba and their ears are in their hands. Somebody somewhere has told them you've disqualified yourself. Somebody somewhere has said, you've done something so bad, you can never be okay with God. Or you've done something so bad, God might forgive you, but you could never be used again. Or you've done something so bad, you would never belong to that group of people. Do you see it? It's called New Hope Church. Church doesn't accept people whose ears have fallen off their head because of something they've done. And that's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Followers of Jesus are never people who remove people's ears. Followers of Jesus are people who put 
people's ears back on. The message of Jesus Christ is never, you're beyond hope, you're disqualified forever, you're gonna get a death penalty for this. No, 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 no. The message of Jesus Christ and the followers of Jesus Christ in this room is, hey, whatever your story, whatever your failure, whatever your shame, come on in here with both ears in your hand if you'd like, and we're gonna put your ears back on because we're followers of Jesus. We do not remove people's ears. We put them back on. That, that is what we're called to be, my brothers and sisters. Which leads me to this question, where have we looked to remove people's ears? I think it sickens the heart of God every time somebody does a Google search to try to find a problem with a man of God, simply to point it out to the world to try to remove his ear. What is wrong with us? We serve a God who puts people's ears back on and if you're here tonight and somebody is taking your ear off and run it through the lawnmower or something and said no 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 no. listen to me the good news is better than that the good news is that Jesus has ended hostility and I'm here to tell you that you're in the right place if you're visiting here tonight and you're not sure if any church would accept you I'm going to speak for them all you're accepted here you belong here but I don't even know what I believe that's okay you're accepted here you belong here we'll walk you through whatever process there needs to be but we are committed to putting your ear back on your head because your life matters to God you are good enough and valuable enough for God to enter into the process to fix the whole world including you. Which leads me to a few application questions. One, have we received the cross that forgives us while rejecting the cross that ends hostility? Let me say it another way. Where have we wanted mercy for ourselves but justice for everybody else? Where have we come up to altars like this with our ear in our hand and go, oh, it's some loving person goes, hey, 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 Jesus has got this and put our ear back on. But then somebody wrongs us and we're chopping their ears off. Yeah, it's not, no, 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 no. You can't want mercy for yourself and justice for everybody else. It doesn't work like that. Being a disciple of Jesus Christ is choosing to intentionally pursue peacemaking. Is there any place that we're escalating violence? Maybe, maybe it's as simple as your home. And your marriage right now is in a crazy cycle. And even, even today, in the car, you were having an imaginary conversation with how you're going to get one up on them. Come on, hey, hey, hey. Hey, all that's normal, but Jesus didn't call us to be normal. Je- Jesus called us to be like him. Are we peacemaking? Where do we need to act first and be a peacemaker? Where do we need to take the step? And I love the way Paul says it. He says, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with people. Now, now sometimes there's gonna be times where you do all you can do and they just ain't gonna have it. And that's between them and God. But we're called to do all we can do. Let's say it this way. Whose ear do we need to repair? Maybe there's a person that's coming to your mind right now and you need to send them an email or a text or you need to make a phone call, make a coffee and say, look, I, mate, listen, I know you were embarrassed by what you did and I know you feel like we're all, no one's thinking about you. We're just trying to get through life. You know what? You know, we, we, I want you to know we love you. Please come on back. We are committed to putting your ear back on because as followers of Jesus, we are never meant to be ear removers, but always ear repairers. <clears throat> Let's say it this way. Jesus has given his life for us. What is our offering back to him? He ended hostility for us. The natural response is to be a peacemaker for others. If you're going to remember anything tonight, maybe we could say it one last way. Next slide. What if the cross was God saying, how far do I have to go for you all to get along? How how far? What what do I got to do? What do I got to do for you to actually believe I love everybody? Is that not enough? Is Is the, you got everything you don't deserve because I affirm your worth. How, how much more? How much more? What, what more I got to do for you to be nice to your wife even when she disappoints you? How far I got to go for you to treat your husband with respect even when he's a bit of an idiot? How far do I got to go for you to love the person at work that you just wish I'd go ahead and take to heaven? How far? How far? How far I got to go? 
How far do I have to go for you to not lay on your horn because someone didn't see you? Oh, how far do I got to go? How serious are we about the cross? How serious are we about discipleship? How serious are we about being like Jesus? So, my brothers and sisters of Toowoomba, please don't take my ear off for going nine minutes over time. It was my last night, and I misjudged this a little. (laughs) I love you so much. Be people who turn the other cheek. Go the extra mile. Give the extra cloak. And above all things, be peacemakers. Be called sons of God. Let this world see us at peace instead of knowing who's right about everything. That's compelling. That's inspiring. May this be the place in all of Toowoomba that is known for putting people's ears back on their head because we take the cross serious. Jesus went that far so we could all get along. By God, may we all get along. I love you so much. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you. We honor you. We proclaim your king. There's none like you. If you're a follower of Jesus, Why don't you just right now ask the Holy Spirit in bravery, Holy Spirit, would you bring to my mind an escalation that I need to take the first move and be a peacemaker? If you're here tonight and you've never accepted Jesus, you've never surrendered your life to him, I wanna give you that opportunity right now. And this is what that looks like. It's not spooky. It's not a ritual, it's a decision you're making in your heart that says, I am gonna trust Jesus's version of my life story instead of the one I've written on my own. I think Jesus's way of living is better than the one I could ever write on my own and I'm gonna trust that. And if that's you, if you could feel God pulling at your heart, if, if, if if you could feel God wanting to restore you and move you into the infinite possibilities he has for your life, If you believe that Jesus' version of your life story is better than the one that you've written on your own, and tonight you want to submit your life to that, I would just ask you to respond in your heart and do that. And if if you've done that, I would just ask you to slip your hand up in the air quickly. No one's looking around. It's not going to embarrass you at all. Just slip it up in the air very quick. Very quick. Anybody else says, tonight tonight I want to trust that Jesus' version of my life story is better than the one I've written on my own. Very good. My second question is this. Is there anyone who would say, I feel like my ear has been removed because of something I've done, and I would like to believe the power of Jesus to begin the process of restoring my life? Is there no one's looking around this and say, hey, hey, I believe that my ear has been Remove. Now, this is a two-part question. I want God to restore my ear, but Holy Spirit, would you reveal to our hearts someone whose ear needs to be restored? May we be ear restorers. And if that's you, I just want you to get in on this prayer. I want you to open your heart wide. Say, Holy Spirit, let this place be a dwelling place for your name, the compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and forgiveness, God. And Lord, anybody who feels they're disqualified, anybody who's felt I don't matter anymore, anybody who's felt the possibilities aren't there, I pray that you would restore them and let the voices of the infinite possibilities that you have for our lives come alive again. And we say yes to them. We say yes. Amen. Would you look this way? Thank you so much for letting me be with you all week. You're so kind to me. Thanks so much for your hospitality. Thanks so much for being just a great group of people to preach to. We've got the date set for next year. I can't wait to do that. Until then, I pray that all of you would take discipleship very seriously. Don't just be saved to go to heaven. Be saved to intentionally live every day like Jesus called us to live. May this be a place where ears get put back on and are never taken off because the cross is how far God went for us to all get along. Until I see you next time, grace and peace. God bless.